guys are ready, I'm cool. I'm looking for a love gangster Someone to be my master I'm looking We gotta start over too. We gotta start over she, She's gonna even the beginning So come out here Yeah, so I wanna talk to the light guy really fast About what, what I'd like to happen Okay, so the cue for the light is When I say I'm looking for love gangster Right on gangster And maybe shine that light right there so don't put the light on when they stop. Wait till I sing and then try. What do you think? I think that's more dramatic, don't you think? Yeah, we're gonna do the full deal, yeah. I'm looking for love, gangster. Someone to be my master I'm looking for a grave maker A little killer so shaker It's not that I wanna die What's up, y'all? Die is a slow way to live Just wanna choke on this time Won't sip away from me Oh, here I got it. <laughs> yeah, I get, I get, I get back. I got the vanilla. Very nice. Thank you. Scott and I are coming up on 20 years of knowing each other in the summer. Hey, yeah, next summer. 20 years I'm, since I met him. Yeah. Yeah, I met him the night that my mom was at that show and. I, had, I didn't have one tattoo. I was dating a guy. His whole face was tattooed. He was a tattoo artist. <laughs> and she said, oh, Beth, please. Whatever you do, don't get any tattoos. I said, oh, I won't, Mom. I said, I'm already 27. I'm not going to get any tattoos. She's not, Yeah, she's not David Letterman. She's got this low cut back dress. Uh, she's got this big tattoo. Still all Letterman scabby. Says, well, let's see this tattoo. just been done. She goes, oh, my mom doesn't know about it. He says, well, she does now. <laughs> That's right. My yeah. friend was her tour manager. Yeah. Okay. And he brought Scotty in to help out. Thank God he did that. So and then, nice and then you were struck by lightning? Well, I walked in the back, uh, in the back of the theater, and he was sitting up against something, and I stopped. And I looked at him and I said, you've got a great smile. And then I kept walking. And then I was up on stage performing, I guess, and my my I road manager at the time, whatever, dude. My road manager <laughs> no, at the I'm time, the my road manager's wife at the time had was standing next to Scott, who he's known her forever, right? And um, Scott, I guess, leaned over to her and no, said, "She said, what, what, you, what about that boyfriend?'" I said, "He'll be gone soon, and I'll be with her." He said, he'll be gone and I'll be fucking her. That's what he said. <laughs> Tell the story yeah, straight, it's man. A, it's a documentary. You got good yeah. things to say. You got to throw it. Yeah, but we're in freaking Holland, man. They don't have any of that crap. You can't say this. You can't say that. Yeah. You're going to hell. Yeah, I know. Let's get going over here. Traffic is not my thing at all. But I'm so spoiled because my husband's either driving or we're in a bus. So I don't have to do any driving. Calling California. Is there anybody home? Hello, 
California Won't you please pick up the phone This is more of Silver Lake, the hipster area I say I love you This used to be so funky, man This used to be edgy part of town I am thinking This is our old house right here with the white I miss you and I married Scott five months after I moved into this part of town. And I'd always been used to living in the edgier part of town. I preferred it. I like the edginess. I like people, seeing real people with, you know, you know, they're working their butt off. They're not making a lot of money. They, you know, they're, they're trying to make ends meet. And there's something about living in communities like that where you're around people that, um, I don't know, there's something that struggle does to people, I find that, brings out the best in them, a humility, a need and desire to lean on their neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where sometimes if you go into places like Beverly Hills or Bel Air, you say hello to someone on the street, they're kind of like, huh? You know, well, I got to wait for all these freaking cars. If this had been the old day, I would have just whipped this around so fast. But now I'm a little more responsible. And it's not your car. And it's not my car. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my car. Meet the champ. Hey, I'm Beth Hart from Los Angeles. I'm out here singing on Star Search. I'm having a great time. When I'm on stage, I'm loving it and I'm feeling it. So wish me luck and uh, say a prayer. And I hope to keep going, keep winning. Peace. From Los Angeles, going for win number two, welcome the passionate Beth Hart. I had won uh, over a hundred grand on Star Search, but I'd spent all the money. <laughs> Partying, having fun, I got a new place to live, I got, I got furniture, you know, and then it was gone. And then, well, you know, half of it you have to pay to the country anyway, winner's fee. So it wasn't like I had a ton of money, but for that age, I had a lot of money. Don't even try what you know you can't do. So now we're gonna go to one of my um, places I lived where I wrote L.A. song. But I remember I was living in a basement apartment. It was the basement of a building filled with roaches. It was the funkiest thing. And twice a year, it would flood with people's shit oh when it would rain. So it'd be this deep of uh, sewage that would come into my apartment. So when I won that star search, I moved here to this building. Now this building right here, look at this. This is a landmark Hollywood building. This is where I moved to, but it didn't look nothing like this, baby. <laughs> it was funky funk town, okay? Look at this. But you can see what a beautiful building, but it was so run down. And this used to be a gate out here because it was a funky neighborhood. So it was all gated with the spiked things. <laughs> and then uh, my apartment, oh my God, this is so badass. And here's my old apartment right there. Right up there, and that's where I wrote a L.A. song. So many songs. She hangs around the boulevard. She's a local girl with local scars. She got home late. She got home late. She drank so hard the bottle ate. And she tried, and she tried, and she tried, and she tried. But nothing's clear in a bar full of flies so she takes and she takes takes and she takes she understands when she gives it away she says man i gotta get out of this town man i gotta get out of this pain man i gotta get out of this town out of this town and out of la and I would never hook up my phone to that front thing. So David and all my friends, I don't, the neighbors had to have hated me. Beth, Beth, they'd have to scream at the window for me to come down and get them. <laughs> but yeah, and then when I started dating Scotty, he would come up in his big white truck. And I remember thinking it was like, you know, the fairy tale when the guy rides up on the big white horse. <laughs> and he'd come up in his big white truck. He's so sexy and gorgeous. I mean, oh, he was great. She's got a gun, she's got a gun. She got a gun, she called the lucky one. 
So when I moved here, it was $625 a month. When I moved out and they kicked me out because I just I just got a little out of control. She cried and she cried. You know I'm a little OCD. Yeah. As you guys know from being at my house, how over the top clean. Well, back in those days, I'd put all my crap out in the hallway and it'd be just tons of stuff that would flip up the whole hallway. And they were like, what the hell are you doing? Can't do that. I was like, oh, sorry, dude. And then like, you know, I'd do it again. So she said, man, I gotta get out of this town. Now I gotta get back on that train Man, I gotta get out of this town I'm out of my pain So I'm going back to L.A. That was a dark day though, doing L.A. song video That was a rough, uh, that was a rough experience And Port Atlantic, they put a lot of money and a lot of support into what I was doing I just, I couldn't handle it I was too, way too far out there and that, so that was also the reason that they dropped you? Oh, yes. And I think they probably saved my life by dropping me. Them uh, saying, that's it. What they did was they took all that stress away and it, it made me, it brought me to my knees. It made me, uh, it made me work to get better. You know, either that or die. It was a choice, you know. You either work to get better or you die. You go to jail. I'm bipolar, one, and um, my mania is the scariest part. That's what makes me want to drink, it makes me want to cut myself. I'm going a million miles an hour, I write tons of songs, Manic, but it's no way to be. I seen myself with a dirty face I cut my luck with a dirty ace I leave the light on I'll leave the light on I went from zero to minus ten I drank your wine and I stole your man I'll leave the light on I'll leave that light on This city can eat you alive, you know? You have to feel that it's okay to not belong if you don't feel like you belong. But did you feel that the city was eating you alive at one point? Yeah, because I think I felt like, well, A, you know, I was unmedicated. I was also really into heavy drug and alcohol use. And um, I felt so small and insignificant, like L.A. was just so much bigger and smarter and better and just really insecure. Was there a moment that you didn't care anymore? What happened? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. There was longer than a moment. I think that I, I really didn't want to live anymore. And I think I was just starving myself to death and taking all those things that I was hoping I would just die. 17 and I'm all messed up inside. I cut myself just to feel alive. I leave the light on. Yeah, I leave the light on. 21 on the run, on the run, on the run. From myself, from myself and everyone. I went into a seizure <clears throat> on Scott's bed and what all I can recall is when I started to come out of it and Scott had laid himself down on top of me and he was asking God and Scott's not really a religious guy but he was saying God please save her I'll do anything please save her and that was the day that I decided to go into um, rehab but it took four rehabs and then years later, I ended up going back to drinking and then I had to go through another. So it's been an ongoing process. Oh, God bless the child with the dirty face Who cuts her luck with the dirty ace She leaves the light on I still leave that light on oh. You know, 
when I'm doing a song like that, though, every time I'm thinking about when it was written and how I felt. And so that was a a really dark time, mm -hmm. you know, because I was admitting all the stuff about myself that I thought was keeping me back from loving and living. But if you say, I want to learn how to love and live, there's got to be some hope there. So I think that, that when they, that light happens, it's like I see other people's hope too. And that's a beautiful thing. This place made me who I am They call me the boogeyman Call me the boogeyman Most of my writing comes when I'm in some state of my ego being smashed. So something's going on um, either with insecurity mm -hmm. or um, fear or some kind of sadness, some kind of um, very uncomfortable feeling. And I think that makes sense because that's why I started going to piano as a really little girl anyway. My parents were going through a divorce and, and it was just hell in the house. It was really sad for everyone. So I went to this thing, I think, searching for God to, to mm -hmm. like a comforting blanket. Would you, do you have a pen on you? Uh, we gotta play this one for Rob, too. Uh, yeah, and just, we'll, we'll get six set up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I'm gonna tell you this right now. You know, you know. That's some motherfucking shit. The motherfucking, motherfucking, I'm done with cussing forever. That That's it, you'll never hear me cuss again. Everything's gonna be frick and rat's butt and all that kind of stuff. Listen, that was really freaking cool. Yeah, that, that was the freaking cool. Unbelievable. That was unbelievable. That was unbelievable. It was pretty rocking. That was the shit. It was pretty rocking. <laughs> that was totally cool. Look at that. That's They don't even know the song. And that's them just going right off the top of their heads and just feeling it out. That's what I'm talking about right there. Yeah, they're only playing with you for how many years? It doesn't matter. They never. They don't know the changes. They don't know the song. And it's just, it's just incredible that you guys are the bomb, man. My good days, I have my bad days, but my bad days are nothing like what they were. But you know what, it's still real life. So sometimes when I think I'm in a little bit of a cycle, my husband says, now you're not cycling, you're called just being human and you're having a rough time. You'll get through this. people around me really know what you have like my label guy knows what I have everyone at the record company and they know I can't work five six days a week like a lot of artists do on the road I can't I will go and lose my head so I take way less money by working less days a week but that way I keep a sane mind you know and that's so important by the way this is my manager that has been with me since I was 22 and he saw me singing out on the streets of Santa Monica with a guitar case open for quarters. And he came up and he said, let's have a meeting. He goes, I want to be your manager. And I said, forget you, man. I don't trust anybody in the music business. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I said, the only way I'll have a meeting with you is if you play cards, because I can tell the character of someone by how they play cards. So he set up a meeting for us at Jerry's yeah. Deli, yeah. and we play cards. And we've been together ever since. And, and we get more excited and enthusiastic. I mean, this man's been with me through everything. Major drug addiction, major hospitals, me ruining a major record deal when I was in my 20s. Stuck right by me, no matter what. Yeah, we're, we're a team. This is the most special friendship relationship I've had in my whole life. Oh my you know, God. from the day we met and we're still here enjoying everything that we do and passionate uh, even more than we were in the beginning, it seems sometimes. Pretty, pretty amazing. 
I think I'm the best manager for her, and I think she's the best man, uh, best artist. For Let's me. applaud for ourselves. Come on. <laughs> Let's just put it this way: If yeah. David stopped managing me, yeah, I would stop. never get another manager. Yeah, I would yeah, be done. Yeah. It'd be like if Scott. If anything ever happened to Scott, I would never get married again. Yeah. Once you've had the creme de la creme, the best steak in the house. You don't go eat a bunch of freaking crap. You're done, man. You've had it. You're good. Yep. Pretty day like this, I almost make sure I live in Amsterdam. I remember that smile, though. That smile just hey. knocked me out. Oh, who's playing the? Who's playing? And I really I'm thought that he must be a dick because he's so good looking and such a charisma. Tell a lot of funny stories, center of attention kind of guy. So I thought he must be such a dick. And then one day I took a walk with him to Kinko's. We were on the, on the road. <laughs> and I, I felt this feeling of feeling so at home. I'd never felt that, not even with one of my best friends. And I just wanted to be around him because being around him, I felt so safe and happy. Just taking a walk to freaking Kinko's, man. It's where you Xerox copies <laughs> of paper and buy like little stuff for notebooks and stuff. And I had the best time. Yeah. And I was so crazy on drugs, and I'd gotten skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. So he was a little gun shy, and I was trying to flirt with him. So I got him like a beanie at a, at a truck stop, and I got him this little rock that was carved into an ooh baby, and gave it to him. And he's like, "This girl is so waggy." <laughs> but, <laughs> but then you came around. Yeah. And he did. I knew we were wacky before that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I had done the, a lot of places up in the world because I was with Atlantic Records. I was on my second record with Atlantic. And that had done kind of okay, you know, good enough to where things were kind of buzzing. Um, but I didn't know how to handle it, you know. So I screwed everything up with so much drugs and alcohol and stuff. So I had nothing. I had no more record deal, nothing. But there were two countries that were interested in my next record, which was the Leave Light On record. And that was New Zealand and Holland. I remember the first show we did here, we were really surprised because they had booked it in the little room, but it sold. And at this time, I had no career. I'd screwed everything up. So when they said they moved it into a bigger room, I was really shocked. We came here and of course I was nervous like usual, but the audience was so warm and wonderful. And I just had a good time, man. And I wasn't even on drugs or anything. I had been sober only for a few, like maybe four months. But I had so much energy and thankfulness. So could you say Paradiso was the start of the comeback? Oh, absolutely. As slowly the rest of Europe opened up, still nothing in our home, even though we live there, uh, but nothing. And then our record company guy, who's Ed, he's the bomb. He is the freaking bomb. He's like the old school days all about music. Didn't give a frick if you sell records or not. You know what I mean? He's like, I love your music. I want to, I believe in it. I want to put it out. And then he, his company grew and grew and grew. And then he opened up a company for the United States and for pretty much for the rest of the world. Yeah. So then we got to start touring and rebuilding there as well. But at that same time, I played a show called the Kennedy Center Honors in the United States. And it was honoring uh, Led Zeppelin that night, Buddy Guy, Dave Letterman. And so I honored Buddy Guy. And because of that TV show, it reopened everything for me in the United States. And I'd rather go blind, I'd rather go blind, I'd rather go blind than to see you walk away. Don't walk away. 
So just one t big TV show really kind of opened things up. And you know, I tell you, I always get nervous. That was the one thing in my life I did that I didn't get nervous. The one time. It's the weirdest thing. I almost feel like God said, you know what? I'm going to take away all your fear just so you can just enjoy every moment of this. Thank you very much there, kind sir. So, you know, I wish sometimes that some of my material was a little, like, happier. Because sometimes when I tell you guys the stories, I kind of feel like I'm using you guys as my therapist or something, you know? But it is what it friggin' is, you know what I'm saying? Um, this song, I wrote this, I think, when I was 23. It's about going to psych ward. So there you go, there you go, more happy times. I'm getting my stage fright again back that I had when I was really young, when I was getting messed up. And I was just on my first conversation yesterday with my psychologist, David, David, about it. And he said, listen, he goes, you know, you're so clean now. He goes, but now it's on a higher level, like it was for a little bit when you were younger. He goes, it's totally natural to get scared, to feel like, you know, what you are is not good enough. He goes, so just know that you're, it's normal. And that helped me feel a little bit better, you know? So you think I'm crazy? Want to take me away? Inject me with the electric shock? I'm not going nowhere. Hear what I say loud and clear. Feel your slight sensation. Free my isolation. She's so right. Second along, she's so right. A second along, how we sing. The second I become you, and what do you say? You know, getting to make music is, is something to bring me joy in my life and to help me get through my life. But the greatest blessings have been Scott and my parents and bipolar and alcoholism. Really, I think those have been the greatest blessings. They've, they've made me come to my knees and obliterated the ego, the big fat giant ego that I love to embrace from time to time. <laughs> and uh, I know I'm gonna have my mental swings I know there are going to be times that I want to drink so bad that I got to bite my lower lip, but it doesn't mean that I have to go there, you know? And what do I get to do to get through it? I get to reach out, whether it be through a song or calling my mother or calling a friend or being honest in an interview, you know, truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Shine the light on the dark and it flees. Shine the light on the dark and it flees. Tell the freaking truth. Even if everybody thinks you're the biggest dick or you're just such a loser, it's worth it because that light will, will drive away the dark. I really believe that. I've seen it happen in my life. You know, shining that light, shining that truth, having the courage to tell the truth. And that's hard. Because of course I want to connect with everybody. Of course I want to feel a part of the group. I want to feel a part of the human race. I don't want to feel alone. God bless this. God bless that. God, I miss you now. All the people left when the blue sky crashed. And I can't do this alone. I am scared to change and to stay the same when I'm calling out your name. Take it easy on me, take it easy on me, and I will trust you, I will let you hurt me carefully. Take it easy on me Cause I break easily And this steel butterfly Will learn to fly eventually God, take it easy on me
When I talk like that When I tell me a part When I raise my voice I break my heart But if I gave it up Let the wall come down Would you take my hand Will you show me how I don't know my place I don't know my own face Just the lines I can't erase It's harder no matter what. If my head is weird, it's hard. But when it's relaxed and I'm not in that, you know, really freaking weird, doubtful thing, um, it's just like the child dream. Getting up there and, you know, singing a song maybe you wrote or something and, and then people know it or they're smiling or they're dancing or something, you know, and you're really connecting. Because then it takes all those years of self-doubt as a kid and it says, no, you do have a place in the world. You'll find your people. And I think that's a big part of musicians doing this business because if it was just about the music, if it really was only about the music, you would never pursue a career in it. You just play at home, you know? But I think that when you seek to go out in the world and connect, there's got to be something in you that says, God, am, am I some kind of freak, you know? And if you can find an audience, it's almost like you find your friends of people that you can, you know what I mean? That, that miss feel like you feel, because you're connecting with them. And it's a great feeling of belonging, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much. Don't make me cry.